seated. Good morning. Great to see you all this morning. You're looking pretty fired up today, like spring is in the air or something like that. And uh, we're glad that you've uh, gathered to worship with us this morning. I might just uh, share with you a little prayer request before we get started. Uh, this week we're going to be going uh, with the, uh, some of the members of the worship team and doing a walk in the word uh, kind of ministry rally in um, Minneapolis. We're on the radio five times a day in Minneapolis, and uh, we've had a lot of response there, and we're going to go there, and then we're going to go to Houston in April, and we have a vision, if God really blesses those events, to take the worship and the proclamation that God uh, gives to us here on a weekly basis, and we have a vision to take it to some of the major centers in uh, North America where Walk in the Word is making an impact. So you pray this Thursday as we go and do that. There are several hundreds of people already signed up for this on the internet, and so we're anticipating a good time. We've rented an auditorium in downtown Minneapolis, St. Paul. And if you know some people that you'd like to invite to that who live in that area, you could uh, let them know about it and they could sign up to be part of that. It's free, of course, but they could sign up and let us know they're coming uh, at walkintheword.com. So will you pray about that? And I'll give you a full report next week and let you know what the Lord uh, has been doing. Now we're going to turn our attention uh, to Psalm 34. And I want to encourage you to take uh, your Bibles now and uh, turn to Psalm 34. This is a new series, and we've just been singing the title of it, Yahweh, uh, Explore, Encounter, Experience. And I want you to look into Psalm uh, 34 now, and uh, let's trust the Lord for a good time together in his word. Now, I'm feeling a little bit badly uh, that you uh, have already sat down, uh, but not because we're going to read the scriptures together, and I'm feeling kind of bad there. You are so comfortable, but not nearly as bad as I'd be feeling if I let you sit down. Uh, uh, when we should be standing to show respect for God's word. So why don't we stand together and uh, I'll just go ahead and go with what I think would please the Lord. How's that? And uh, let's read uh, God's word together. There's uh, 22 verses in Psalm 34, but we're just going to read the first eight uh, in this service right now, okay? So let's kind of get ourselves focused. If you have a New American Standard version of the Bible, you can read right out of the Bible that's in your hand. Um, but I'm going to lead us uh, by reading off the screen. Psalm 34, beginning at verse 1. Let's lift up our voices and read together. Begin. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Thank you. You may be seated. That actually goes down through verse 7, which is the passage that we're going to be uh, studying together this morning. And uh, before uh, we do that, let's take a moment and uh, bow together uh, in prayer. Father, thank you uh, this morning that we can uh, be here in this place and that we can have such a setting of comfort and freedom to study your life-changing eternal word. And I pray, Lord God, this morning that by your grace, I pray that you would uh, just uh, fill us with your spirit as we study your word and uh, help us, Lord, uh, to uh, treat it with the respect that it deserves. Might it have free a course to move about in our life. And even as we're listening, listening to the proclamation of your truth, might we be continuously examining our own lives and behavior and experiences to see how we might more fully align ourselves with you. So we commit this time of learning and pray that it would be worship to you, both in what's said and in how we receive it. And these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Psalm 34. Now normally when we start a study, uh, we do a little bit of a background uh, check uh, on the scripture itself. It's important to understand, you know, you can't just like rip up the Bible and say, now nah, I'm going to study this passage. Now I'm going to flip over here. I'm going to study this passage. Now you got to know what kind of scripture you have in your hands. And when you're studying epistles, letters that have been written, that's a very different kind of scripture than say when you're studying uh, prophecy. And prophecy is another kind of scripture and it's to be studied in a different way. And when you're studying Proverbs, 
Uh, wisdom literature, that's very different than what we have here in the book of Psalms. Uh, this is poetry, portions of the book of Job, uh, most of the book of Ecclesiastes, and here uh, the book of Psalms is poetry, and it's written poetically. And yet we understand the poeticness of it. Even that we understand literally. So for example, when God says, uh, I will shelter you under my wings. Does God have wings? No. But, but, the, it, it, but it's poetic truth to communicate a literal fact that God does shelter uh, his children. In the same way, we have poetry in the book of Psalms, but it communicates literal truth about God. And now we want to begin to study uh, Psalm 34. <clears throat> Under these four headings is the background. First of all, understanding the Psalms. Understanding the Psalms. Like I said, we have here poetry. Uh, the actual word Psalms uh, comes from a word that means literally the twanging of bowstrings and, uh, or harp songs. And the book of Psalms is a collection of 150 psalms or songs, most of them written by David and used uh, for worship in the temple. Now here's an overview of Psalm 34. There's 22 uh, verses, which originally were 22 lines, and in the Hebrew language it was an acrostic, so that the first letter of each line was a consecutive letter in the Hebrew alphabet of 22 letters. Like if you wrote a little poem, A, B, C, D, were the first letters in each line, and it would help a person memorize it. Of course, a lot of that's lost in the translation into English. Psalm 34, the overview, it's divided into three parts, verses one through seven we'll study today, eight through 16 next week. And then 17 through 22, Lord willing, on Easter Sunday. The general subject of the 34th Psalm is an unapologetic call or invitation to the lavish benefits of life found in Yahweh God. Let's talk about the setting for a moment. You know, most Psalms are written by David. 73 of them bear his name. Uh, but the New Testament confirms, for example, Acts 4.25 teaches that uh, David wrote the second psalm. And so even there are psalms that uh, don't bear David's name, but that we believe were written by David, though they were not all written by him. And then one of the things that you find in 14 of David's psalms is you find that the actual setting or occasion of the writing or the circumstances that led to writing the psalm are actually recorded right in the scripture. Notice above verse one, do you see it there? A psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech who drove him away and he departed. And uh, that's referring to a story that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel, and, uh, but David was a mighty warrior. And while Saul had been a successful leader of the army, David was incredibly successful, so much so that the women in the city of Jerusalem used to sing the song. Do you know the song? It was a little line they would sing that David has killed his thousands, or, or Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul used to get kind of bitter and jealous about this, so finally he couldn't take it anymore, and he chased David right out of Jerusalem. David had to flee for his life. He must have been really fearful because the place that he ran to wasn't very smart. He ran to Gath. That was the hometown of Goliath. The people there weren't very fired up about David when he got there, and he all of a sudden realized he was in more danger than when he left Jerusalem. In fact, 1 Samuel 21 tells us that along the way he had actually picked up and was carrying Goliath's sword. So he was afraid for his very life, and to make matters worse, David's trying to hide out, and all of a sudden, 1 Samuel 21.11 tells us that the people began to sing that song. Man, this must have had some catchy tune because everybody was singing it. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David took these words to heart and greatly feared the king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely on in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down on his beard. That was his plan. He acted like he was crazy. Then the Achish, which is the same as Abimelech, it's the king, and the king said to his servants, behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? I think you're acting like a madman. Shall this one come into my house? So David, so anyway, he got free. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. 
So God miraculously provided for David's escape. And then the first time he got alone all by himself, he was like, oh, that was crazy, I was gonna die. And he wrote down Psalm 34. So that's the occasion, right? I think that sheds a lot of light on what's to follow. And so that's the setting. Now one more thing on, under background before uh, we get into the text itself. The key word here, or the key concept, is the word Lord or Yahweh as we were just singing. Now, that's kind of an unfamiliar term to us, isn't it? Yahweh, and we don't say that very often, but that's God's name. That's God's primary name. Now in the Old Testament, make a note of this, three main titles were used for God. Uh, Elohim, which is, I got my number written right down here, I forgot it. Um, Elohim is used 2,602 times uh, in the Old Testament to refer to God, but that's just like generic God, like small G-O-D, like any God and all gods and false gods and true gods. It's just the generic word for God. Adonai, which is not even really a name, it's more of a title, it means master is used, and that's translated in your Old Testament, uh, L and then lowercase o-r-d, that's used 336 times. But then this, uh, this term, a uh, capital L, all in caps, L-O-R-D, that's translated in your Bible, uh, the word Yahweh. And uh, in your Bible, you have it Lord, all in caps. That's used 6,828 times. It's the primary term to refer to God in the Old Testament. Now all of that to say this. The reason why the term Yahweh is not commonly understood, it's quite a lengthy explanation, but essentially the matter is this. The Old Testament Hebrews, out of reference for, reverence for God, did not want to speak the name Yahweh out loud. It was sort of a weird superstitious thing because God wanted us to speak his name. He went out of his way to reveal his name to us. It was more of a superstitious thing. It wasn't commanded in any way, but they thought it was respectful, and so they would never say that name out loud. And if you understand the Hebrew language, when they translate it, actually the Hebrew language is all consonants. There's no vowels at all in its ancient form. And uh, so like my first name in Hebrew, the letters would correspond to J-M-S, much like what we, you know how we'll uh, write the word building, B-L-D-G, or limited for a company, uh, L-T-D. But for them, it was the whole language. It was uh, no vowels at all. Well, later on, people started mispronouncing words, and a group of people known as the Masoretes came along. And what the Masoretes did is they said, here's how you pronounce this stuff. And they would put what's called vowel points at the bottom underneath the consonants, and then people would know how to pronounce the words. But here's the thing, and all that to say this. They were so hung up about saying God's name that they, didn't, they put the vowel points for the word Adonai underneath Yahweh. And that got so confusing that uh, the King James Version, when they translated the Old Testament, they made up a word. This, how many people have heard the word Jehovah? Well, Jehovah is a made-up word. It comes from the hybrid of the consonants for Yahweh with the vowels for Adonai. And, and it's, it, it, but later on, scholarship understood that really the, uh, the best guess is, is that the right pronunciation of those four consonants, Y-H-W-H, this is God's name, Yahweh. Let's say that together, say it. Now it's an incredible thing when you think about it that God doesn't want us to know him in some far off conceptual way, but he's told us his name. This is God's personal name. And while we've not heard it or become accustomed to it because of our lack of familiarity with the Hebrew language, you should feel, feel very comfortable speaking to, worshiping, and even referring to God in this term, uh, Yahweh. And of course, it's so important in Psalm 34 because the word is used 16 times in 22 verses. Add to that the pronouns he, his, and him 10 more times. And clearly, without question, God himself is the theme of this song or psalm. Now with that as a background, let's begin our study together with this thought from verses one through three. I must choose to be a worshiper. If you're gonna be a worshiper of Almighty God, it's only gonna be because you make a choice to be that worshiper. Look at the 34th Psalm, verse one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
and let us exalt his name together. Now under that heading, I must choose to be a worshiper. Notice this, first of all, let's spend some time understanding worship understanding worship. Because here in that passage that I just read to you, there are six words for worship. Do you see them? You might circle them in your Bible. Six different words, like soldiers uh, surrounding the seated sovereign, each one with their own salute, each one with their own angle and way of ascribing worth or worshiping Almighty God. And it's important that we as his worshipers understand each of those six words. Let's take a moment and go over them. Do you see the first one? Bless. Now that's an incredible concept. I will bless the Lord. I think we're a lot more familiar with the concept of uh, God blessing us. And God blesses us with health and strength and a roof over our head. But, but think of it for a moment. 35 times in scripture, three, five, we get this concept, I bless the Lord. Think <laughs> myself, what could I add to God? What could I give to him that would matter in any way? And yet he in his own word has told us that when we worship him, we bless God. Now how many people want to be on that team? I'm like, are you kidding me? God has given me so much, and I can do something that blesses God? Sign me up. I really want to be part of that. No wonder he said, I will bless the Lord. What does it say? At all times. Look at the next word. Praise. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, praise is more than a mere compliment. If you just say to somebody, honey, you look nice today, or my, I really like your hat, that's not praise. More than a compliment, praise is commendation. It's homage. It's honor. It refers to things beyond externals. Praise refers to actions and the very nature of a person. And when we praise God, we're praising him, not for what he looks like, not for anything visual or external, but for his very nature and for what he's done for us. Here's the third word, bless, praise. What's the third one? Boast. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Now my mom always told me that it was a bad thing to boast. How many people got that at home? Don't be boasting, nobody likes a bragger. But here's the thing, as wrong as it is to boast about yourself, it's that right to boast about God. 1 Corinthians 1.31 says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Psalm 27 says, some boast in chariots, some boast in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. And maybe best of all on this subject, Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23 says this, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, there's Yahweh again, that I am Yahweh who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. Now this is incredible, people, that we can boast in the Lord. The next time you show up after a long weekend, a bunch of people are standing around in the office waiting to get to work, there's some cheesy guy or gal standing there boasting about their exploits of the weekend with a member of the opposite sex and somebody else steps forward and brags about this new investment that they've got. Somebody else is bragging about an accomplishment that they've made at work and all of this so shameful for the people that God has created and you can step to the center and boast about God. Let me tell you what God's done for me, and let me tell you how God's taken care of me, and I've been going through this, but God has been so faithful, and the children of God, the people of God, are called upon to boast in the Lord. He's great, and what he's done for me, and he'll do it for you too. I love it. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it, and here's the fourth word, rejoice. Rejoice is simply an expression of joy. 
Did you know that deep within the heart of every person is a fountain? Jesus said, the water that I give will be like a fountain of water springing up within you. And within each of you is a, is a, is a God-given capacity to do this thing called rejoicing. It's, it's a fountain inside you. But worry and fear and sin plugs the fountain of my joy. But when I get reconciled to God and I get right with him, bubbling up from inside me is this joy that I cannot contain. And it bursts forth when joy is in the heart. Rejoicing is on the lips. Rejoicing. Two more. Magnify. Do you see it in verse 3? Oh, magnify. It comes from a Hebrew word which means great or important, to expand or to enlarge. In 1 Samuel 12, the Lord magnified Saul by making him king over Israel. In 2 Samuel 5, the word is used for the growth of David's reputation. In Acts 19, after the demon-possessed man was chased out of the sons of Sceva, the name of Jesus was magnified. In Philippians 1.20, Paul said that he wanted Christ to be magnified in his body. It's the idea of taking something and seeing it for its true size, understanding it. You see a little bug as a child running along the sidewalk and you sit cross-legged and you look at it through a magnifying glass and you have a better understanding of what exactly it is. Well, of course, we don't make God larger. Magnifying God is rightly estimating in my soul the size of God as he truly is and allowing him to be lifted up in my eyes, which, of course, leads to this last word. Do you see it there? Exalt. The word exalt means to take something that's small and make it large, or more specifically, to take something that is low, of no importance, and to make it high to give to it an elevated or celebrated status. Let us exalt his name together. After my grandmother died last summer and the funeral was held, we had to come pretty quickly back to Chicago. And as much as I hated to leave my family, we had responsibilities here. And after the funeral was over and so on, many of our family, my brothers and my aunts and uncles and my parents and all of them went back to my grandmother's house and each person took something from my grandma's house that they could really remember her by. And I felt so badly we weren't there and when I finally was able to get there in November, I, there just wasn't really very much left and I went rooting through the house and my dad had uh, set uh, this aside for me. And this might not mean a great deal to you but it means a lot to me. And, I remember going to my grandmother's house as a very small boy, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old, every Sunday after church for Sunday dinner, and sitting right in the front hallway when you'd enter the door. My grandmother was really big into, you better study and work hard, and there was this little schoolboy there. But this had been in a place of real sort of disregard in her home in later life, but it is in an exalted place in our home now. And you understand the illustration of what it means to recognize that in your life, God has been on the shelf or in the closet or placed in some place of lesser significance. But to recognize that and to go to that place and say, Lord, this isn't where you belong. You belong in an exalted place in my life. You need to be elevated as the only one, the only and supreme affection of my heart. If you understand that, then you understand the concept of exalt. Now let's say those six words together. If you've been making notes, many of you have. They're right there in the text. The first word is bless, and then praise, and then boast, and then rejoice, and then magnify, and finally. Now worship is all of this and more. Notice that it says in the text, his praise shall continually be where? In my mouth. People say, well, I worship God with my actions. Well, I think actions can be worshipful, but the context of worship in Scripture has got absolutely nothing to do with your actions. 
You want your actions to back up your speech, but in Scripture, actions are not worship. They can be holy. They can be pleasing to God. But worship in Scripture is something that begins in my heart, and it comes out of my mouth. So if you've been coming to church every week and sitting back with your arms folded and kind of passively and saying, well, I worship with my life, buzz, okay? No, no, we worship with our mouths. We express and sing and speak the praises of God. You say, well, I'm not a very verbal person. Well, then you need an upgrade. And I don't care if you don't talk from Monday to Friday if you don't say a single word. And if you're one of these people who only says like 200 words in a whole week, save them all for Sunday morning. All right? So that you can say from your heart, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be where? Point to it. In my mouth. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You say, but James, sometimes I'm just not there. I gotta tell you, I'm not there. Well, this will help you. Make a note of this second thing. Worship is an act of my will. Worship is an act of my will. It's a choice that I make. How can you miss this? Look at verse one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall, not should, not might, not may, will, shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. It's a decision. Worship is an act of my will. I gotta tell you, maybe some of you will relate to this. One of the things that I hate doing most of all is I hate shoveling snow. How many people hate that? That's just like the worst job, man. And it starts snowing, and my wife looks out the window, and she's like, oh, it's snowing. And I'm going, I have to shovel it. I can't believe it. And I, I hate the snow, and I hate shoveling snow. And, and she hates it too, apparently. And I, <laughs> and I gotta tell you this. this. This probably won't surprise any of you. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life where I've all of a sudden like, hey, 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 here I am. I'm shoveling snow. Like, I, I, don't, I don't all of a sudden find myself, hey, what, what do you know? I'm out here. I have my coat on, my hat's on. Look at me. I'm shoveling snow. How did I get here? No, no. I've only ever shoveled snow in my life when I have decided to. It's a choice that I make. I never get there by accident. I'm never surprised by it. It's something that needs to be done, and I do it. Got it? Now, some of you say, well, I'll worship when I feel like it. No, 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 listen. Worship is a choice, and it never ceases to amaze me how many of the Lord's people get up on a Sunday morning, get themselves showered and dressed, pick up their Bibles, get in the car, drive over to the church, find a parking spot, walk into the building, find a seat, stand to worship, and stop one decision short of really worshiping God. Now, God calls us to this. God calls us to be his worshipers. John chapter 4 says that God is looking for worshipers. Man, I want to be on that team, but I have to make a decision. I have to make a choice. David is pleading with us to worship. That's why he begins verse 3 with my favorite word. Do you see it there? It's my favorite word in the whole passage. Do you see it? It's just one letter. Say it. But it isn't like that. It's not like, oh. And it's not like, oh. It's like, oh. That's what it's, he's like, oh. You want to try it? Go ahead. (laughs) That's great. He's like, oh, magnify the Lord with me. As in, do you have any idea how close you are to the very purpose for which you were created? You are so close to doing the thing that we are going to do with joyful bliss through all of eternity. And now you've showed up at the rehearsal. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Worship is an act of my will. You say, James, that's fine and would be fine for me at most times in my life, but I gotta say, we've been going through some deep waters. We've been facing some difficult things in our life, and 
I don't suppose I've ever been at a time when I feel less like worshiping. Well, notice this thirdly then. Worship is for all times. You see it there in the text? Just teaching you God's word. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. At all times. Three critical, victorious words. Say them. Now together, lift up your voice. When do we worship? Now this is absolutely critical, loved ones, and there's so much here for us. I will bless the Lord at all times, when I feel like it and when I don't. Until you understand this, you will never understand true worship. You may remember the story of the Willis family back in the mid-90s. Actually, Janet and Scott Willis became sweethearts in junior high school when he was a rough and tumble wrestler and she was a budding school teacher as teenagers Janet devoted her life to God and Scott followed soon afterwards and their obedience to Christ took them along a path that Scott became a Baptist minister and early into their marriage at the age of 20 and God blessed them with three children they called them their A team because after a nine year break, God blessed them with six more children. They moved to the Mount Greenwood uh, neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, and after two years of attendance, Scott became the pastor at Parkwood Baptist Church. In November of 1994, they were traveling with their six younger children on Interstate 94 up into Wisconsin, and a truck pulled in front of them, and. Uh, 90 pound metal bracket flipped off of the back of the truck. Scott had just a split second to come to a decision. Fearful that swerving would cause the van to tip over, he tried to run over it and tragically the metal bracket caught underneath the back of the car, punctured the gas tank, and as the sparks began to fly up from the metal dragging along the road, the car ignited in a ball of flames, and before he could even get quickly over to the side and slam it into park, five of his six children had burned to death. Ben, the eldest son at 13, died later at the hospital. The sheriff said, I've never seen an accident like this. And as he and his wife lay on separate gurneys there in the emergency room, and paramedics swirling all around them, their minds swirling, no doubt, unable to comprehend such a loss, the Lord brought to Scott's mind the scripture that they were memorizing as a congregation, Psalm 34. He took his wife's hand, and he said, no doubt, through his tears, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And Janet kind of recoiled, unable, understandably, to get to that place. But through the support of her husband and their family and their church and believers all over everywhere, within just a very few days, they found themselves out of the hospital and at a press conference as everyone was trying to come to grips with a tragedy of this magnitude. And with microphones in their face and press everywhere, they began their press conference hand in hand. The first words they spoke in public, I will Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And I'll tell you, there is blessing and joy in that difficult place that those who have not experienced it cannot comprehend. The children of God are called to bless the Lord when I'm seeing his goodness and when I'm not. When the future is bright and sunny, but also when it's cloudy and uncertain. When God's presence is so real, I feel I could reach out and touch him. But also, when God seems so far away, the apostle Paul said, in everything give thanks. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter 13, let us continually offer unto God the sacrifice of praise. And Job, who lost everything but lived to see the Lord's justice and goodness, spoke the words, though he slay me, 
yet will I trust him. And David in Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And listen, if you want to understand worship, if you want to understand what it is to really know God and, and to walk with God, I invite you out of the shallow waters, out into the deeper, glorious truths of following Yahweh God. And so much of it hinges on this. Worship is for all times for all times, this should help you. Notice this fourth thing, worship is a witness to others. Worship is a witness to others. Do you see that in verse two? My soul will make its boast in the Lord, the humble will hear it and rejoice. Now that's an incredible promise. Look at it again yourself. My soul will make its boast in the Lord, the humble will hear it and rejoice. Think of it. Who are the humble? Well, the humble are the people who have allowed the difficult circumstances of life to break them down to the point where they see that they need God. There was a time in my life where I thought I had it all together, but then I figured out, right? Then I figured out I needed God. Those are the humble people, the people who say, you know what? It's not working for me, and I can't go it alone, and I'm willing to acknowledge I need the Lord. I wonder how many of you come in here Sunday morning, week after week. The truth were known, many times you're thinking about people that aren't here. Your heart is breaking for brothers and sisters and parents and children and other loved ones who don't love God like you do and aren't worshiping him. And often you pray and you say to yourself, well, what's gonna turn the corner? What's gonna make the difference? What's gonna bring them? I'm telling you what is. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. And, and, and more so than we ever realize, these people are watching us, watching us. And you know when they're watching most keenly? Not when everything's going great. Because when everything's going great, they're not looking for anything else. What they want to know is, does God make a difference in your life in the most difficult circumstances? Does God really give you strength and lift you up when times are toughest? And when criticism and complaining and doubt and discouragement flow from our lips right in front of the people that we love and long to reach, what, what damage we do to God's desire to embrace those people. And here we see the sequence of how God works. During the toughest times in life, when I choose to praise God then, the humble ones, the ones who God is going after, the ones who God's intending to reach, I can't guarantee everyone, all we want to do is arrive in heaven someday with the people God wanted to reach through us. Amen? And if at all times I praise the Lord, if at all times I boast in the Lord, the humble will hear of it and they will rejoice. Worship is a witness to others. Worship is a witness to others. And then notice this, worship is a team activity. Don't you love that? Man, I don't go much for those solo sports, you know, each guy doing his own thing. I like the team stuff, you know, where people work together. And notice what it says in Psalm 34, how clear could it be? Oh, magnify the Lord, what? With me, and let us exalt his name together. This isn't something you do by yourself. This is not a solo sport. You said, man, you should hear me in the shower. I am like so great for God in the shower. Okay, well, that's your business. And I, I mean, I wouldn't even discourage that. But I'm just telling you, the main event is not you on your own. The vain, main event is you with me and us with each other. Let us exalt his name together. And I want to just encourage you this morning what a blessing it was uh, in this service to sit back at the back here as y'all were worshiping God and to hear you lifting up your voices and singing the praise of God and entering into worship. And those of you who are on the fringes of that, regardless of where you sit, I can only invite you to step forward and experience the joy of really setting down whatever is burdening my life and saying, you know what, that doesn't matter right now. What really matters is that I exalt the Lord and that I give him his rightful place in my life and in my worship. Worship is a team activity. It's for everyone. You say, well, I, I want to be a worshiper. I, 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 I sense the Lord calling me, and I haven't worshipped him at all times, and I, I haven't been as I should be in that. Do you, any help for me? 
yeah, I got some really good help for you. If you look how the text continues, make a note of this second main thought. I have good reason to be a worshiper. Let's chase through those last verses, four through seven, and notice five reasons to worship. I have good reason to be a worshiper. Here's the first one. The Lord answers prayer. Do you see that at the beginning of verse four? What's it say? I sought the Lord and he what? He answered me, he heard me. And that's why I worship right there, because God answers prayer. Did you know that God answers prayer? I'm here to tell you, God answers prayer. And if you've been frustrated with your prayer life, well, let me just ask you this. Bring to mind right now something, one or two things that are big burdens that you have. Now, honestly answer. How many times, and I mean specifically, numerically, how many times have you gotten alone with God and got down on your knees and poured out that situation to God in prayer and said, God, I trust you. God, I lay this. I'll tell you what happens more often than not. We think about God. We think about the situation. We toil and, and spin and worry and fret. But I'm asking you, how many times have you got along with God and really knelt down in prayer? If you've done that, you're seeing answers to prayer. If you're not seeing answers to prayer, then you have some barriers. There's some real reasons. Because I'm here to tell you, God answers prayer. I have never sought the Lord fervently and earnestly and persistently when I have not seen him answer prayer. And if you've not experienced the Lord answering prayer, I got a little booklet here that I want to share with you. And I'm just going to make these available at the front. There's like a hundred of them or something. Now don't come and get them if this isn't like some big issue for you. All right? But if you, have been, if you haven't been fervently praying as I described, don't come and get this book. But if you have been doing that and you're not seeing the answers to prayer, there's reasons why. God said, call unto me and I will answer you. And if you're not seeing the answers, there's something's in the way. And so we have this little booklet, Overcoming Barriers to Answered Prayer. How many people say, I, I feel like I got some barriers in my life, some barriers to answered prayer. Well, just you, you, you can have one of these, all right, but come and get the rest of them afterwards, and hopefully that'll be a real encouragement to you. I don't have, that's a message from years ago. I don't have time to go into all of that right now. We're on the subject of worship, and David says, I sought the Lord. That means to make a careful search, an active, aggressive inquiry or pursuit. And when we do that, God does answer prayer. Here's a second reason to worship. I have good reason to be a worshiper. The Lord delivers from fear. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fear. I wonder how many of you here this morning know what it is to be filled with fear, anxiety about the future and what's up ahead and what's gonna happen to me. You know, I chose this passage on Psalm 34. <laughs> I've never done this before, but I chose to speak on Psalm 34 because Roy and Carol Gromke asked me to. Actually, it was Carol. And uh, Roy and Carol are in the service. They're sitting right over here. and They mean so much to us. And, and I'll never forget the first time I met Roy and Carol. They were some of the founding members of our church when there wasn't like less than 20 people. And we got together in a room. Remember this, Roy? And we got together in a room and uh, we went around and said, how come you guys want to start the church? And how come you guys want to? We just said, we're thinking about it and we're still trying to decide. And Roy says, because I'm needing feeding. <laughs> Remember that, Roy he said that? And uh, that was such a cool, I've never forgotten that. And Roy and Carol had been faithful 38 years in one church and God called them to come and be part of starting our church. And let me just tell you this, before almost all of you were here, there were some very difficult days in our church. And if it wasn't for Roy and Carol Grompy, humanly speaking, there would be no Harvest Bible Chapel. That's a fact. And so not surprising then that it was a pretty difficult news for some of those who know us well. Uh, several months ago before Christmas when uh, the word came and, and uh, you know, if you know Roy and Carol, they're so close, you know. And Roy, Roy had had some pain in his chest. And so Carol was like, you're going to the hospital. He's like, I'm not going to the hospital. You're going to the hospital. I'm not going to the hospital. And so she finally got him there and and he had uh, a mild heart attack just, I think, as he was getting to the hospital. And uh, turns out he has to have, what was it, Roy Quintuple? Five bypasses. And, uh, you know, Roy's in his early 70s now. It's a big deal to have surgery like that. And, 
And we were all burdened for them, and I'll never forget the night we arrived up at the hospital and, and uh, the surgery. I hadn't gone that well, and Roy should have been out of intensive care within 24 hours, and that went on for how many days, Carol? He was in intensive care for about six days. It was, it was really pretty touch and go, and we didn't know if Roy was going to, we didn't know if he was going to live. And he may have had kind of a mild stroke or something during this procedure and didn't recover as quickly as we had certainly hoped. And several days later, we were visiting with them in their home and it was a hard time and Roy was struggling. God's been so good to you since then and we're so thankful to him, but there was a real dark, difficult time there. And I said to Carol, I said, Carol, you know, how, how are you coping with this and the pressure and all the weight on your shoulders and Roy's been such a leader in your home and to see him struggling like this. And, and she said, James, I don't know how I'd have make, made it if it weren't for our family and Psalm 34. And she said, every night, Roy and I, before we go to bed, we read Psalm 34 and we go over these, and, and what nourishment there is there. And she said, she never said this in the whole history of our church. She said, would you preach on Psalm 34? I said, I'll do it. And, and what, what this scripture has meant to them and what it's meant to so many others, listen, it can mean to you. And if you know what it is to experience as they were experiencing fearful days and uncertainty and what's up ahead, Listen, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. That's why I worship him. He answers prayer. He delivers from fear. And I love this third one. Notice, the Lord delivers from shame. Yahweh is a God who removes our shame. Notice what it says in verse five. They looked to him, Yahweh, they looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. Now, how many people know what it is to look in the mirror and feel shame and to see yourself? And we see shame in the face of others, but how many times have you seen shame in your own face? You look and you say, how could I have done that? How could I have said those things? How could I have allowed myself to fall into that again? I'm so frustrated with myself and you, you feel shame about that. I often wonder to myself how a man can neglect his family for year after year after year and, 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 and get into alcohol and gambling and fritter away his life and, 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 and sometimes in his 50s or his 60s he'll find Christ and his life will be changed and all of the shame of all of those years, it's gone from his face. You can see it in people's faces, the shame that they feel. I think of women that I know who have given themselves cheaply and indiscriminately to so many different men over a period of years, and, and they come to the end, they feel so, so cheapened by that, and, and, and they, could anyone ever love me, and, and how could God love me but to find the Lord? and to have God wipe away the shame and to be clean and pure before him. You begin to understand the truth in this verse. They looked to him and were radiant. Isn't that great? And their faces were not ashamed. And I wonder how many of you have come in here this morning and you're standing at the end of a long series of bad decisions. How could I have done these things? How could I have made these choices? I proclaim to you a God this morning who loves you and would wipe away your shame and would return to your face a, a radiance that, that would betray the fact that you'd had any failure in your past. And God loves you. And God gives that radiance to his children. And that's one of the reasons why when we all get together, that's why we worship him, amen? We love this God so forgiving, so forbearing. The Lord delivers from shame. Um, two more. The Lord delivers from trouble. Look at verse six. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Maybe your situation is not some great dark sin, but just the day-to-day -day troubles of life, just the difficult circumstances that you go through. You wonder to yourself, how can I get over these things? How can I get through these things? Well, David, the strange part of verse six is, notice where he says, this poor man. This poor man. What's that doing there? Everything else is they and we and I. It's almost like David can't stand it anymore, and he's right in the middle of the worship service, and he's like, this poor man, right here, this guy. 
He called out to the Lord, and the Lord delivered him out of all of his trouble. This guy right here, this guy, this one right here, who will probably never sit this close to the front again. <laughs> and it's, 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 like da- it's like David wants to say, hey, you know what? This is not some abstract thing. I'm not talking about some God on Pluto who helped some people someplace. He's like, you know what? This has happened right here in this room. I am walking up and down the rows and looking at people who have experienced the the incredible truths that I'm proclaiming this morning. This has happened to us. This has happened to this woman. This has happened to this man. This has happened to this woman. We're the ones who have experienced this, and that's why we're the ones that worship him. Because the Lord delivers from trouble. And then this incredible truth in verse 7. The Lord protects his own. And says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. That term the angel of the Lord means a messenger. It's actually a confusing subject in scripture. The angel of the Lord is a messenger sent by God to give messages to people on earth. And he has different roles. The angel of the Lord appears to Hagar, to Abraham, to Jacob, to Moses, to Gideon. And sometimes in the Bible it seems like the angel of the Lord is Jesus. And he speaks for God. And he he speaks for God in the first person. And this has led people to think that the angel of the Lord is Christ. And I'm not sure really. In the New Testament, the angel of the Lord is said to be Gabriel. Hebrews 1.14 says this, that angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And who are those who will inherit salvation? Those of us who have turned to Christ in repentance and faith. And the, the word encamp there, the angel of the Lord, I think representative of the, of the entire angelic host, because the word encamps, do you see that there? Circle encamps in your Bible or whatever your translation says. The angel of the Lord encamps around, you know, it's a military term. It's just like the angel of the Lord, the commander of the angelic host, it's like he steps in and he says, all right, set up a perimeter around his life. Set up a perimeter around their home. Nothing gets into the circle, but that Almighty God signs off on it. Is that a great picture? You say, man, there's been some stuff getting into my circle. Well, just know this. It's there because God allowed it, and God's going to use it for a reason. And, And God Almighty protects. Well, you see what it says in the text. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, who respect him, who give him his rightful place, and he rescues them. I got a letter from one of our staff wives this week, Deanna Steiner. She's married to Kent, who directs our compassion ministry and works in the inner city. Actually, they used to live in the inner city and do ministry down there years ago before they joined our team. And uh, Deanna just wrote me a letter saying, man, I'm so excited you're preaching on Psalm 34. This, This scripture has meant so much to us in our life. And she told me three different stories of the power of these verses lived out in a believer's life. One of them had to do with a time when they were moving from one place to another place and found out that they were going into rival gang territory and and she was really afraid for her life. She was working at Moody and a man came and spoke on Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. She says the Lord gave them confidence that he could they could trust his protection and move, and they did. And one night while she was in the apartment, she woke up and smelled smoke and flames in her apartment and just seconds from the whole place being engulfed in flames. And Deanna again experienced the protection of the Lord as she escaped with her baby and her husband was not home. She told me this third story, and I wanted to share it with you under this heading of a God who protects his own. Let me just read. She said, in March... Kent and I had the, Kent had the opportunity to take a trip with the church staff to Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. While Kent was gone, I continued my usual routine. One sunny afternoon, I was leaving work. When I got to my car, I was forced into the back seat by a strange man. I was completely taken by surprise, and at first, I, I was a bit amused. I, I couldn't believe he thought he could pull this off in a public place during broad daylight. Reality quickly hit, though, as he threatened me and his intentions became clear. I looked out the car window and saw no one in sight. I realized that if anyone did walk by, they would not be able to see in the car, and I was terrified. 
Suddenly, God's peace completely washed over me and an amazing strength and confidence, not my own, she says, an amazing strength and confidence inspired me to look that man straight in the eyes and out of my mouth came the words, I am a Christian. God is my father and he will not let you get away with this. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my car. And after a few seconds of silence that seemed like hours, he looked at me and said, you're right and got out of the car. Praise God he had protected me again and our five-month-old baby. I learned that later in the morning, Ken's parents had prayed specifically for protection and wisdom for their children. I also learned that while Kent was in Brooklyn, he had felt led to pray for me at a specific time, and immediately after praying, he wrote me a letter telling about his prayer. He put the date and the time at the top, and when I got the letter, I saw that he had been praying at exactly the same time. I had been forced into the car. Now, I want to ask you a question. What if God had allowed her to be injured? What if God had allowed her to be harmed in some way? Would she still have had to live out the truth like the Willis's did? I will bless the Lord at all times. See, I proclaim to you a God this morning who we love and trust, though we in our finiteness do, all, do not always completely understand. And I exhort you this morning to step into the green pastures of a resolute commitment. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And often people say, well, I wish I was experiencing more from God and if God would do more for me, I would, I would do more, I would worship him more. I think you've got it backwards. I think if you would commit by faith, isn't faith always first? Does God show us and then we decide? Or do we decide by faith and then God shows us? It's the second, isn't it? Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. The choice to step by faith into the resolute commitment to worship at all times unleashes a flow of blessing and favor into our lives that we cannot imagine until we've experienced it. And I commend it to you this morning. Let's bow together in prayer. Father,